Keith McCullough, and welcome back to the Investing Summit. We're going to shift gears big time here from Buddy Carter to Brigadier uh, Robert Spaulding, who wrote this great book called The Stealth War that I've been citing lately. Uh, we're, we have a little bit of a history with this internally in terms of not only reviewing the book externally to some of you that, that read the early look note in the morning, uh, but my partner here at Hedgeye, you may have never met him before, but uh, the president of Hedgeye and my longstanding partner, uh, founder of the firm, Michael Bloom, uh, has the backstory on how we got to know Rob a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Keith, and uh, good to see you all. Uh, so Rob and I actually met on Twitter a couple months ago. Uh, I was born in Hong Kong and have been uh, very actively following uh, the situation in Hong Kong. I actually spent uh, on and off a good portion of my life there. and. I was not really uh, an expat brat, uh, but I grew up for a large part of my life in a Hong Kong Chinese family of a very prominent Hong Kong uh, Chinese tycoon, and uh, who, uh, of course, were very and, and continue to be very pro-establishment and very pro-Beijing, uh, which is rather the, the opposite end of the spectrum where I find myself on. And so uh, Rob's musings on Twitter caught my attention. And uh, as we connected, uh, Rob, it uh, turned out actually that our general, uh, Emo Gardner, who runs our defense policy research, um, here at Hedgeye uh, was for much of the past 20 years the director of the George and Carol Olmsted Foundation who incidentally in 2000 uh, picked you uh, when you were a young and very talented B-2 stealth bomber captain uh, to go to China to learn the language and study the Chinese and this of course uh, set you up for a career that led you to become the uh, China strategist for the Joint Chiefs of Staff and ultimately into the White House um, so I thought maybe we could just start to uh, set the stage here a little bit and you tell us about your, your time in China in the early 2000s and uh, how, uh, how that uh, really developed your career. Yeah, it was, it was a great time to be in China. I had spent uh, the year prior at the Defense Language Institute learning to speak Chinese and so I got in the country uh, able to communicate fairly well. I was, I was near fluent. And um, all of my neighbors uh, in Shanghai were building in the Shanghai Special Economic Zone. And, and China was booming. They just entered the WTO. And um, it was an amazing experience. I took my family, my wife and my two young boys, uh, ages four and seven at the time. And we traveled all over the country. Uh, I studied at a university, Tongji University. I got to know the people, the language, the culture, the geography, the history of China and really was, um, you know, exposed to, you know, what it what it's like to live there um, as a as a student. And um, it was it was a life changing event. I'll put it that way. And it was a wonderful event. It was so great. In fact, I told my wife when um, when uh, I was going to retire at, after at the end of the air, at the end of my Air Force career, I was going to go back and start a business in China, uh, in <laughs> Shanghai and, uh, you know, get wealthy. <laughs> As many have, <laughs> indeed. But since you've written this fantastic book, I mean, eye-opening book, suffice to say, I think uh, there, there, are, there, I, there are more than a few books, I guess, now that have made the rounds on Wall Street uh, that, that, that some of my friends, Kyle Bass in particular, would, would wholeheartedly support. Um, a lot of these people have a, have a decisively more negative view than the consensus view on China. This book certainly would have fit that bill. What inspired the timing of it, Rob? That, that is, I guess that's my main question. Uh, obviously, the timing here matters. And you also said hey, we have a fairly short timeline uh, to get to some kind of a change. Yeah, so um, I, when I left the White House, I went back to the Air Force, and um, I made a decision at that point. I could have continued my career. Uh, I'd only served, uh, essentially, by the time I retired, two years as a one-star. It's usually a three-year uh, tour, and clearly the Air Force um, wanted me to continue, and I could have continued in the Air Force and, and, and moved up the ranks. But I thought this was such an important topic to get out in front of the American people, everything I had learned in the last five years. And also, I wanted to provide background and context for the national security strategy. Our government is changing. The policies uh, that have essentially been in place for the last 30 to 40 years are changing. And they're changing in ways that um, business can either get on side of it or they can fight it. And if they get on side of it, they can potentially profit from it. If they fight it, if they try to say, hey, you know, we want to preserve the status quo, then they're going to find themselves on the other side of where policy is headed. So I wanted to inform the private sector because I thought the sooner the private sector got on board, the more, the better they would position, be positioned to take advantage of the way our government is changing. 
but also it would help accelerate the, the healing that needs to take place in our country. So it's really about providing an executive summary of everything I had learned and background and context for the national security strategy, which is driving how our bureaucracy is changing the way we incentivize business to do what they do. Yeah, what I really appreciated about that was the context and the naming of names. I mean, that, of course, uh, would not exist if it was a Wall Street investment banking oriented researcher from private equity, for that matter. And you do go, go into detail uh, on the conflicts of interest associated with that. Uh, but I do think that, at least for me, I'm like, wow. These are people that I either know or I know a lot about, and you put them on a time series uh, and certainly a, a, at a level of accountability that I, that I had not uh, seen before. Did you get did you get a lot of pushback on that? Uh, no, not I haven't uh, gotten any pushback. The ones that I named are are public um, names that, quite frankly, have been very vocal and have had plenty of articles written about. Uh, how they may be influenced by the Chinese Communist Party. So I, I was very careful not to, you know, out somebody that hadn't already been outed because it wasn't really about blaming them. It was about just showing how pervasive, you know, and you can do that with just a couple of examples, how pervasive the Chinese Communist Party influences in, in our society. Uh, and I think to get back to your last question, you said about the three years, you know, one of the things that I see every single day I'm, as I'm watching the policy come out of uh, the out of D.C. is we're throwing sand in the gears of the Chinese Communist Party. And as that happens, that timeline lengthen, lengthens. We have more time to do what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Rob, the, the key tenet in your book is that the CCP uses political and diplomatic engagement and deception to gain control and expand China's spheres of influence without going to war. Uh, we're not talking about a hot war here. We're talking about, um, as you describe it, stealth war, but really across a lot of different um, uh, strata. And uh, you describe this in a CCP paper that talks about unrestricted warfare. Can you explain to our audience what the Chinese mean by unrestricted warfare and all the, the outgrowths that that takes? Yeah, it's, um, if you read, uh, and I know a lot of people in business have read The Art of War, and what you realize is a lot of uh, Chinese strategy, number one, is not really time-oriented in the way ours, uh, our strategy-making process is. It's more about the ebb and flow of uh, strategic trends and, and taking advantage of them and then allowing them to carry you to where you want to be. And, um, and it's not also about military conflict. It's about getting your adversaries either to fight with each other or to otherwise undermine their position using stealth, using uh, diplomacy, using, you know, essentially, uh, you know, what they would call spies. Um, but it's really about not going to war in the traditional sense in the way that the West has uh, thought about, you know, national security. Uh, let's talk about uh, corporate espionage and, and economic warfare. There is uh, an episode in the book that uh, you describe about a, a private equity owned American chemical company that gets so thoroughly uh, infiltrated and hacked uh, by uh, the Chinese state and, and the CCP. Can you uh, uh, tell the, this story to our, our, our viewers and then um, you know, we can start to, to draw some conclusions as to how this is really impacting our economy and our businesses here in this country? Yes, and this was the this was a, the presentation that I received in the fall of 2014 that broke my mind and, and made me realize that, okay, you can do some of these things that we have done with the B2 with bombs, but you can also do it with information and uh, and finance and economics. And essentially, what it was, it was a, a three billion dollar chemical company that was on a five year arc to IPO. It was in year four, everything's going fine, then all of a sudden their sales starts uh, declining about two to three percent. Their logistics efficiency declines two to three percent, and uh, so they fire the sales manager. They uh, get the leadership team together, say, "Hey, we need to we need to do a better job here." And then within about a month, they get an unsolicited offer for thirty percent below value for the company from a Chinese firm. Now, what was interesting to the private equity company was that this thirty percent below um, actually corresponded to the decline in performance of the company going forward, and so. They got suspicious because the valuation could only have been done by somebody that really knew the, in, the internal operation of the company. Sure enough, auditing company came in, found the breach. 
I found that the company itself had not only been breached, but also the private equity company. So they knew the targets that the private equity company used to, know, to, to realize that something other than um, you know what was going on was going on. So the only way they figured it out uh, or had a hunch was because the valuation that they had offered was so precise. So of course the auditing company comes in and they clean up the, 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 the cyber hack, but then they go back to the company in the, in the, in the financial audit and they ask him, did you notice your sales decline? And they said, yes, two to 3%. And they said, well, somebody was pulling your, your um, uh, bids uh, for uh, orders off, but they're only pulling a few of them off. And then their logistics are like, did you see notice a decline in logistics efficiency? And they said, yes. And they said, well, you know, when you, when you would order a thousand units of input to, to, for the thousand units of output that you needed to, to create, those orders were changed to like 900 units of input, forcing you to reorder that extra 100 units, increasing your cost of goods sold. And so what they were doing is essentially using uh, precise knowledge of private equity, but also of the business itself, to put it under duress just so they could acquire it. Now, why did they, did they want to acquire it? Because there is green technology that was uh, in the company that they wanted to acquire and take back to China. So when I saw that, it was the first time that I realized that my God, this is going on across our, our country, across all kinds of industries, because it wasn't just a chemical industry, it was all kinds of different industries. And, and we were essentially, the nation had been for a long time under attack, and quite frankly, because the government doesn't look into and can't look into our society, it was a, it was a stealth attack because nobody knew it was happening, other than the companies themselves. And they didn't want to share because it affected valuation, for instance, for this company, it would have uh, affected their ability to, to, to pull off the IPO. Yeah, it's shocking. I mean, the scale of this is probably, uh, this is not an isolated inc incident, I assume. <laughs> no, no, and, it, and, it, and, and it's, it's sophisticated tradecraft. This isn't like some guy going and hack. This is like, you know, expert understanding of business, expert understanding of how, you know, like the, the, the tactics they use to pull this off in terms of luring um, the guys with root access to the network on, in order to get access, I mean, we're, we're sophisticated, um, uh, um, human, human intelligence, tradecraft techniques. I guess, I mean, if you can go right off the, the deep end starting to think about how sophisticated one could be. Um, you know, how entrenched and how sophisticated do you think they actually are uh, and, 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 and about to be? Well, you mean uh, currently, I mean, they, so imagine that, um, AT&T had the full resources, the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, and uh, DOJ at their disposal to go after all their competitors everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's how bad it is. Yep. And not only that, but um, also they could go reach into the Treasury and say, hey, you know, uh, you know, Fed, we need money so we can go buy this, uh, this technology. Uh, and we're going to use, you know, the CIA to basically hack them, figure out how to undermine them, and then we're going to go, we're going to basically put the company under pressure so it can't survive, and then we're just going to go strip all the assets. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, that, that's, uh, talking about that can certainly get you scared. Um, but if you, if you also take it, and, and they can also use our own. I mean, I, I think the scariest uh, point of awareness in the book for me was actually the link between McConnell and, and Chow and what you're insinuating. I, I, couldn't, I can't get to the finish line on that, obviously, but uh, maybe just for people who have not read the book, can you give, can you give a quick summary on, on, on that conflict of interest? Yes, well, it's not quid pro quo per se. I mean, that's the, that's the rabbit hole that we get stuck going down. It's about adopting a worldview that says, open markets lead to wealth, wealth leads to democracy, let's just stay open to China and they'll be, uh, at one point become free. And so, the reason Biden and McConnell were both in the book, because both of them had been very vocal about being against tariffs on China. Now, China is a non-market economy that uses subsidization and tariff and non-tariff bears in, in China to create an unassailable position from which their companies can, can launch attacks on uh, economies and industries all around the world. And we're just supposed to not tariff them? I mean, that... The whole idea goes against even what Adam Smith wrote about in the, in, in the invisible hand of, of capitalism. So it, it, it is really about protecting our economy by recognizing that there's the second biggest economy in the world is a non-market based economy. 
So your book goes farther than just outlining all of these things that the CCP is doing, but it's really also opening up a playbook as to how to counter this. And um, maybe stepping aside from the book for a second, but I personally found this whole NBA situation in the last 10 days absolutely fascinating. Uh, because while the Chinese are very, very sophisticated, um, nobody in the last 30 years has really stepped up to challenge them and to say, hey, here's a line that we don't allow you guys to cross. Um, and I think that they are operating from a sense of extreme uh, overconfidence. And they're really not used to playing in the Western media uh, on, a, on a level playing field that, that Western democracies and leaders in Western democracies are uh, generally accustomed to. And I think they've made some pretty significant mistakes here uh, in the way that they've dealt with the NBA and obviously the tremendous public backlash uh, across society that that has, uh, uh, has, has provoked here in the United States. Might be the first time in the last couple of years that everybody seems to be on the same side of this issue. Uh, can you talk about challenging the CCP and what the strategies are that are going to work and what the low-hanging fruit are? Yes, and, and I think the, to your point, NBA is a perfect example. You know, I talk about in the in the book about Roy Jones. I mean, it's not the NBA; they're not the first one to run afoul of the Communist Party or feel their ire in terms of Im impacting their profits in the country. Um, I think in terms of you know what we uh, what we're trying to do uh, with the national security strategy is begin to use things like, for instance. Uh, we use Foreign Corrupt uh, uh, Practices Act against our companies all the time, but we've never brought one single case against a Chinese company. We force our companies to comply with audit and transparency requirements for registering and listing on our markets. We don't force Chinese companies to, force, to comply with audit and transparency requirements uh, for, for registering and listing on our markets. Uh, as far as accounting, we count assets in, you know, cash in the bank in China held by our corporations as level one assets, yet they're in a non-convertible currency situation with strict capital controls for, so that money can't come out. So actually calling those assets what they are, which are level three assets, would force a restatement, which then would affect uh, the, the value of the stock, which would then affect the compensation of the executives and the, the board of directors of those companies. So there's all kinds of things that we're doing in addition to the tariffs, which are absolutely needed and need to be made permanent, that actually get at going after the Chinese Communist Party for essentially, and we've allowed it, quite frankly, them to uh, have a different rule set for their companies in our, in our country. So that's really what it's about, stop doing stupid. And uh, you also point out that, that one of the Achilles heels here probably is the Chinese banking system. Oh, right. And, and, and really, the, the, the best one to talk about that is Kyle Bass, because he's absolutely right. They've got something like 50 trillion in debt uh, with only 2 trillion in assets. So they're completely underwater. By the way, most of that uh, real estate um, ha was, was built on money that was lent by the United States during our recovery. So hundreds of billions of dollars to build those ghost cities. And most of the debt is internal to the country. So it's 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 domestically held debt but nevertheless china needs dollars to buy raw materials to buy food to buy energy and the way that they are getting those dollars now because of the tariffs have slowed down um the influx of dollars and really they they their capital accounts gone to zero is to use msci our world and emerging markets index to increase the, the percentage of equities chinese equities uh, in the portfolio and bring in more dollars, I, I think, to the tune of four hundred billion uh, over the next year. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna get that. I mean, at, at some point, MSCI EM or Emerging Market Index, it's easy to see them at least at a third to forty percent of the index. So, you know, their achievements, which again are pending, as opposed to just new and out of the blue. I I, I was just with Kyle Bass last week in Texas, uh, as a matter of fact, and, and, I, and I do agree with uh, most of his numbers. If, if anything, we've gone back and forth and back-checked them ourselves just to make sure uh, that the prevailing negative view from Wall Street's perspective, I think he would certainly carry that flag, um, is well represented and, again, again back-checked. Uh, but Kyle, I, I think, I mean, some of the so, great... So the great said, oh, sorry, go ahead. prevailing negative view, because I'm seeing, the, the, the research that I'm seeing go out to investors is you need to pour your money in the Chinese equities. That's yeah. what I'm, and, and when I talk to the Goldman guys, that's what they're saying. These, you know, we need to go into equities. I'm like, 
we're in a trade war. That doesn't make any sense. No, I mean, well, Goldman, I mean, that's actually what, you know, next to the big bean deal, what, what Mnuchin said he was going to have is a nice new deal for his buddies over there on financial services with the Chinese. I mean, there, you couldn't make that up if you tried on the fly. I couldn't believe that he just piped up and said it plainly and admitted it. Um, but, uh, but what Kyle does spend, and, and spend a lot of time convincing me of or making me aware of, much like your book did, are human, these human rights violations and how explicit they are and how, obviously, grotesque and, 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 and broad, and broadening, for that matter. Is that one of, to Michael's points, one of the places to confront the Chinese explicitly from the Oval Office and actually make it real? Well, I think the, the, what the president has decided to do, and, and, and he's, he's pretty consistent with this, is establish a clear line of communication between him and whether it's a good country or a bad country, their leader. Um, but what Pompeo has done as a Secretary of State, and particularly with his um, assistant secretaries and his ambassador at large for religious freedom is basically go after the Chinese and really go after human rights and civil liberties and rule of law uh, and democratic principles violators everywhere. And so um, typically what we've done in the past in the State Department is not, is toned down that kind of language. He's uh, from the bully pulpit as the Secretary of State has been pounding on them and I think uh, it's a good thing. You know, the Chinese Communist Party for too long has gotten away with murder not not figurative murder real murder and we've turned a blind eye for it for bro, uh, for profits yeah it's unbelievable i mean it's a, it, it, the more the more you learn the the, the scarier it gets um, we're we're going to we're, uh, we're going to engage in some of the q and a here uh, rob if you don't mind soon but uh, one of the questions actually is a follow on to that have you uh, one question is have you ever actually spoken to president trump uh, on on all of this directly no, I have never spoken to him directly about this. Mm -hmm. So that's a wide open net. There you go. I mean, who do you think it has actually spoken that comes from your perspective, that, that, that has your explicit point of view on this that has taken it right to the hoop on him? Look, I, I'm, <laughs> I joined the National Security Council as a bureaucrat, one that had a lot of expertise on uh, strategy, particularly because I worked at the Pentagon uh, for two years between 2014 to 2016, actually deeply considering how a national security strategy might look that actually took into account the, the vulnerabilities of globalization and the internet. So, and then I had a group of people that worked for me that um, continued to work in government and some of them are still working in government. And so, you know, I represent in a lot of ways the deep state because we were focused on how do we look at national security. So I helped craft and, and be the architect for the national security strategy. I wasn't the guy to go in and whisper into the president's ear, and I'm fine with that. It was really about what I wanted to do is create the right argument and framework for the bureaucracy so that they could begin to, with the top cover of the president, understand and then deal with the challenges that our nation faces. You know, our challenges aren't, aren't airplane and ship and tank related, they're actually economics, finance, and information related. And when you understand that and, and you have the you know that you have the tools, the authorities to do that in terms of what department and agency you're working in, then you can go and do that. And so that's what I focus on. Well there's a pretty significant shift in the mindset that needs to to happen here in, in America and I think in the West in general because the the going theory that if we just engage uh, with the Chinese or, or with totalitarian regimes and expose them to our culture uh, over time that will open these countries up. China has proven that this doesn't work, certainly in, in every instance, and it's, it's absolutely not working in China. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's actually a, 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 very, it's a monumental shift in um, consciousness that needs to happen here. Yeah, it's, not, it's only not working. They basically re-engineered globalization and the internet to rather than being the purveyor of democratic values and human rights is to be the purveyor of whatever interests they want and so that's again demonstrated greatly by nba where the nba uh, you know an nba general manager uh, says he supports the freedom uh uh protests in hong kong and of course the communist party says uh, not if you're going to um, continue to sell stuff in in china and so this this uh, seeping, you know, influence in economic and financial, and you know, with 5G in information, then creates the hooks that they have into corporations, into Wall Street, into academia, into politics to begin to influence the decisions of those of those leaders and elites. 
On, uh, on this, uh, just trying to, like, to Michael's point again on the bipartisan support on the NBA topic, um, is, it, is it possible or probable that Elizabeth Warren just actually just outflanks Trump on this, given Americans' propensity to accept that this is actually the truth? Well, I think she could. The problem with Elizabeth Warren, quite frankly, is one of the things that um, we need to do in this country is reindustrialize. You know, we off we offloaded our industrial capacity to China to a country that has um, basically uh, almost slave labor and uh, huge environmental uh, concerns to the tune of 30 percent of what's going in the in the environment today, and. In order to bring that back, that manufacturing, we need to rely heavily on our natural gas reserves that are really right now um, allowing for us to have the lo some of the lowest energy rates in the OECD. And so when you stop that and you turn that off, not only do we not, is manufacturing not uh, being offset by that low cost energy, we're back in the Middle East because the Middle East becomes a flashpoint because we need them to produce energy. So really becoming independent on energy and reindustrializing the country as a way to you know improve the environment and improve and improve or reduce exploitation of labor but you really have to look at the world differently than we currently are in order to to get there you know so that's i think that would be the only criticism i would have of her platform uh, on the topic of Hong Kong, and you and I have talked about this uh, on the phone several times in the last uh, four, five, six months. I, I just got back from Hong Kong about ten days ago, and uh, you know, I met with a lot of my friends and, and, and contacts uh, across the spectrum. And there's really nobody uh, at any level of society in Hong Kong that really has a solution for how to get out of uh, this dilemma. Uh, the five demands that the protesters have. Uh, are pretty clear. They, they end with universal suffrage. Uh, just last night, Carrie Lam in her policy address uh, essentially said that that's off the table and, and, and not up for discussion. She used some terminology about the time not being right. Um, <clears throat> what, what, what's your view? Have, have you gleaned any new insights in the last two, three weeks on, on this issue? Obviously, we just had the uh, Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act passed yesterday. But uh, is there anything happening that you see that can shift positions here? The, the only hope that the people of Hong Kong have is that we hold uh, the Chinese Communist Party's feet to the fire about the special relationship that allows Hong Kong to be a window to Western capital markets. If we can do that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, personally, the elites have a lot of their money in Hong Kong, and they don't want to see that um, be affected. And so if we do that, and, and that bill that went through the Congress needs to go through the Senate, um, then I think that the, they have a chance of at least getting the five things that they wanted. But look, what they realize is by 2047, um, they're gonna, as they go back to get, getting away from this uh, one country, two systems, um, they're going to lose their freedoms because the Communist Party isn't, uh, isn't going to democratize. So in a way, it may be delaying the inevitable, but you know, I think the only way that they have any semblance of, ch of a chance and by the way, the only way that the Chinese people have any semblance of a chance is that the United States stands firm for democratic principles and actually forces China to obey the rules of the road with regards to economics, finance, trade, investment, and really human rights and, and civil rights. Uh, and just quickly, um, I think Keith wants to jump in here, but uh, the five demands, uh, they're talked about a lot, but I'm not sure that audiences in the West necessarily know what they are. Uh, they are release of all the prisoners um, since the beginning of June. They are uh, to stop calling the demonstrations a riot. The, the riot charge carries with it a 10-year prison sentence, which is why that's really important. Uh, an independent investigation of the police. Um, the um, um, uh, repeal of, of the extradition bill, which is something that Carrie Lam has committed to at this point, and ultimately universal suffrage. Hmm. Right. That's a lot. All right, we're going to just uh, take, give you maybe 14, 15 minutes of, of, of questions that have come in here, uh, General, and qu quickly on, on Huawei, a bunch of questions on that. What's your take on Huawei, Chinese government control over this, and, and Chinese technology companies, the entire topic, really? Yeah, so I think Huawei is going to have a hard time going forward. You know, what what they've done in the telecommunications industry is really destroy uh, a lot of good companies uh, and force a lot of good companies to really be shells of what they once were. You know, they would go so far, and I've talked to telecom companies about this, they would go so far as to if a company had won a contract to build a network, 
they would walk in and say, we're just going to give you the network, right? Of course, they would make up the money on software upgrades later, but you know, it made it absolutely uncompetitive for um, other companies to compete. And so when you do that, uh, China was not doing that because um, they were, it was a purely economic decision. It was also a national security decision. If I control the flow of your data, I have access to the flow of your data. And so that's what they were doing. And, and so they made it almost an arm of the military in terms of the way they would deploy it. I flew a B-2, I would take, a, take networks out with bombs. They just went uh, ahead and bought or built them so that they would be able to control them. So the, the Huawei is a clear national security concern. And this is what I've said from the very beginning. You know, everybody said because of what the president said that it was a, it was a component of the trade war. It's not a component of the trade war. It is a national security issue. They've, made quite, uh, they've stated quite clear, clearly now that that's the case and it's separate. And I don't think it's going away. Huawei is going to have to deal with the fact that it's going to have to compete on a, on a basis with every other telecommunications company out there, which, by the way, is going to rapidly fill the, fill the void. And as nations realize that you can't trust a Chinese company to build your telecommunications network, they're going to seek to build it um, through other means. Yeah, I guess there's this effervescent hope on Wall Street that this will be a grandiose deal that includes you know, provisions on technology. I mean, I, I guess they, they, you're attempting to say that it's part of phase two, but do you believe any of that? Is, is there any chance the Chinese give up on any of this in terms of their longer term plans? Look, you have the, you have the CS, CIA, the NSA, the you know, DNI, all of them come forward and say, FBI, that they're a threat to national security. So then to go back on that, I mean, you've got in the entire federal bureaucracy state and Congress on both sides of the aisle saying this is a problem. I just yeah. don't see uh, how you get around that. It, look, again, I come from the deep state. I'm a bureaucrat. The, you know, there's enough information within the bureaucracy to know that this is not good for America. And I think you know most of the on the right and the left, the the, the lawmakers agree. So this is this is a non-negotiable. Huawei is bad. It's not coming back to the United States. It's going to be in, found in far fewer democracies going forward because we're out, you know, our State Department's out with sharp elbows saying, look, you want to be a partner and ally, a security ally of the United States, and you're running these uh, Huawei networks. Guess what? You can go look elsewhere for, for your defense. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I think in a lot of people's eyes, when you say I'm just a, uh, I don't th I think you meant to, you know, to diminish that, but d you're just a bureaucrat. I mean, we do have actually, and I wanted to make sure I said this, there are plenty of comments in the queue. Uh, one, one said, my great grandfather was a brigadier general in World War II. I wanted to thank you for your service and your voice in bringing China, uh, China to attention. I mean, I think that that's really your patriot and that's, that's something that, that a lot of people are looking forward to hearing more and more of your thoughts on that. Um, so I just, it's just a comment. But a, a lot of other comments, I gotta say, Rob, on you know, how can China win this war without ever firing a shot? And moreover, how can the US win the war without firing a shot right back? Well, so um, look at it this way. When we were dominant, uh, we only had, we only traded and had, gave access to our capital markets to democracies nations that actually upheld the principles that are in the Atlantic Charter. Atlantic Charter is a one-page document signed by FDR and Winston Churchill that kind of lays out uh, the template for the international order that they were going to build at the end of war, the, the war they knew was coming, which was World War II. And it basically laid out democratic principles, free trade, rule of law, and self-determination. And together as democracies, through the end of, the, of World War II, through the entire Cold War, these nations, these democracies work together to, through multilateral institutions like the UN, like WTO, like Bretton Woods, like all of these um, systems and institutions that were created after World War II to uphold those principles. And what happened at the end of the Cold War was we stopped that. And, and so free trade and democratic principles became uh, unlinked and our foreign policy really became about open markets lead to wealth, wealth leads to democracy. So we're just gonna open up and over time these countries will democratize. Now we're going back to reestablishing uh, along with, so we're forging a new consensus along with allies and partners around what the national security requirements of 
a globalized and internet powered world are and how do we establish using economics and finance control geopolitical control back over those multilateral institutions to protect that you know liberal open order that is what we are currently doing on a bilateral basis you can't do it multilaterally because china takes a couple of bilateral relationships and they'll hijack a multilateral institution that way that's what they've done to the eu quite frankly which is a democratic multilateral institution with a lot of nato allies but yet they 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 go to the side of the chinese communist party on many issues and it's because of the financial and economic relationships they've established with Greece and Hungary, for example. And so we have to unwind that. So what does China do? They basically take American innovation and, and Western innovation, technology, talent, and capital. In America, we have 40% of the investable capital. And they repackage that in Chinese Communist Party ideology. So they basically rip off the American sticker, slap on a Chinese uh, PRC sticker, and then they ship it out to the world. That's what's been happening. When we don't allow them to have access to our innovation, technology, talent, and capital, then it becomes much more difficult for them to do that. And in fact, it becomes nearly impossible. So democracies working together, making a truly functionally market-based free system that also promotes democracy and democratic principles is what the national security strategy is trying to do. And can we do it? Absolutely. We we got here from allowing China into the WTO in 2001 and lost those 70 plus thousand factories and 3.4 million manu manufacturing jobs. And it was because precisely we went away from that every year they were having to go through that most favored nation trading uh, uh, vote at the Congress. I guess this is at the core. I mean, it's really in the introduction of your book. You, you, you state plainly, perhaps nothing threatens the CCP more than the Constitution of the United States. China's President Xi has stated as much. That, I mean, I, don't, I, I still don't think that that's, that's considered a given amongst most Americans. I just don't think that everybody knows that. Right. And, and you know, so, and I didn't know it either. You know, I lived in China and I thought, hey, China's <laughs> great. I went back there to work. And then, of course, I start reading the Chinese Communist Party documents. I read their constitution. I read document number nine, which is a which is a document that was uh, in 2013 was spirited out of the Communist Party and was translated in English. And it basically you can put it right next to the Bill of Rights and say uh, this is basically designed to destroy the Bill of Rights. Yeah. Do so, document nine being that. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. And so, you know, the uh, the idea that we don't believe in freedom of speech just for freedom of speech, we believe in it just because we want to destroy the Communist Party. I mean, on its face, it's ridiculous, but this is what they write in their, in their, in their internal documents. Mm -hmm. Just in the, uh, in the last couple weeks and months, uh, the PRC has actually been successful at uh, uh, getting uh, more countries to disavow their relationship with the Republic of China, Taiwan as we know it. Um, what's your view on that? I mean, obviously Taiwan doesn't have a lot of allies left in the world, unfortunately. Well, I think it's just a pattern uh, that the, the Chinese Communist Party is, is undergoing to essentially isolate Taiwan to, um, by the way, Taiwan has a bunch of money, uh, billions of dollars invested in the mainland. So they're using those relationships just sort of like they're using the relationships with U.S. corporations to under, undermine the cohesiveness and the, you know, the sense of wanting to maintain uh, democratic principles within Taiwan so that over time, you know, they can just move in and take over. And, and of course, you know, I think what they haven't, and that's why I say that the, the Constitution is so threatening, is that at the end of the day, there's only so far people are willing to go. And that's what clearly what you're seeing with the people of Hong Kong is that, you know, yes, uh, people want to have uh, wealth, they want to have money, but they also want their freedoms. And especially if you've tasted freedom, if you've grown up in in a totalitarian regime, if all you've known is is the slavery of the mind that comes from you know forced censorship, then you don't really know what you're missing. But you're talking about in in Hong Kong and Taiwan, people that know what democracy is, know what rule of law is, and they have no interest in going and in, in, in living under this under the um, uh, totalitarian regime of the Chinese Communist Party. Yep, that's definitely correct. On the topic of, uh, again, something that I was educated on just by virtue of reading uh, Pillsbury's book, actually, Assassin's Mace and how Xi believes in that. You know, having something that we could have turn inward on us. I'm a Canadian, but I do live in America, and Michael's actually a German and lives in America. But again, um, what is that thing? I've, I've often wondered if it's the U.S. stock market. No, it, it really is. So if you look at in 2007, 
um, you know, when uh, when the iPhone iPhone came out, you know, we were the second country in the world to build a 4G network. So when you put the smartphone platform, which was basically and Apple and Google, uh, along with the pipe, the uh, 4G, it really created the economy. So we went from you know the top five in market cap being AT&T, General Electric, Microsoft, Exxon Mobil to Shell to being the fangs, mm-hmm. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. What they what the Chinese Communist Party saw is okay. They, the U.S. dominated that by, by creating this new platform, mobile computing, uh, and paired it with the 4G network, which was a pipe for data that would actually allow us to build you know, the app, service, and business models of the e-economy. And they said, well, we want to do that in 5G. And in 5G, the platform is actually the network itself. So, it, so the, the smartphone as a mobile platform kind of blends into the background, and the, and the compute is done on the network. And that's so it can allow for the connectivity of rather than 10,000 devices per square mile, it's 3 million. And those 3 million devices per square mile are cameras and microphones and drones, self-driving cars and automated um, surgery devices and all these other things that are going to be the IoT of the 5G economy. And so if you look at the world, the 4G world, if you don't want uh, the Facebooks and the Googles of the world to be tracking you, you just opt out of the of carrying a smartphone you can do that in the 5g world you walk out of your house and you say uber because uh there's cameras that'll pick that up microphones that'll pick it up uber shows up they don't ask you who you are they already know because they've got a camera on the car and you get in your car and you go someplace that's 5g it's really about making the world around you respond to you and in responding to you the companies have your data it's part of the fabric of the way that the, the system is built. If that network is unsecure, then not only do the companies have your data, but now the uh, foreign country has your data. But more importantly, China is a, wants to be, just like I said, the U.S. was the first to build this world. They want to be the first to build the 5G world. So not only are they are building the pipes, the network, the platform for the app services and business models of the 5G economy, they're actually building... Uh, the app services and business models themselves around the country. So in Beijing now, you pull out your uh, your smartphone on WeChat, you order food. When you walk into the restaurant, a camera picks up your face, they greet you by name, and they hand you your food. So they're already starting to put into place, you know, the, the, the characteristics of the 5G world in China to make way for this transition, which was going from 4G to 5G. You see very uh, you, almost nothing like that here in the United States. So that's how China is essentially what they want to do is build into the technological fabric and the business fabric the means to reach into societies and enter in, and influence at the individual level based on your consumer habits and also based on your social media uh, interactions. Uh, so Rob, we're almost out of time and, and we just got a comment and question in which I think is a, a great conclusion and summary as to what it is that we here in the business community and the financial world can, can actually do. Uh, and uh, our, our viewer writes, uh, so trading with partners that accept our mutual values and earning profits not at any cost, that's exactly the point. Um, I think American corporations have been very, very short-sighted in their dealings with China, uh, trading short-term profit for essentially long-term bankruptcy and now putting our national security and, and really all of our freedoms and values that we cherish and, and have fought for for so long here in this country at risk. And uh, it is that comment exactly that encapsulates, I think, the responsibility that we have in the business community um, to, uh, to take on ourselves. Well stated. And what I will say is, uh, you know, the uniform, uniforms of the front line of this war are what your guys are wearing right now. I mean, you guys are literally fighting for the national security and the democratic principles and the preservation of our republic in the actions you do every single day. Uh, that's uh, that's a great way to, to put a summary point on it. And again, thanks for, for your longstanding service and now your, your new service. This is this is big time. And I think uh, most people that, that do not follow you uh, should follow you, read your book, and certainly you're live there on Twitter too. So thanks very much for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks, Rob. And uh, for those uh, institutional clients of ours who are watching tomorrow at our Macrocosm, uh, if you're attending, we're going to have a copy of this book for you so you all get to read Stealth War by Rob Spalding. Thank you so much. All right, coming right up, we're going to come back with the heat. Josh Crum, no uh, stranger to Hedge ITV.